right, let's take our Bibles this evening and turn to John chapter 14. The Gospel of John chapter 14. <clears throat> and we'll be reading verses 7 through 9. John chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Let's pray. For, Lord, I pray that you'll bless these next few moments that we share together. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll help us set aside the thoughts and cares of this life and this world just momentarily so that we can hear your word and the Holy Spirit can have free reign, free movement in our hearts and lives. And uh, Lord, we're very needy today. And we thank you so much for knowing and supplying those needs. And we ask your blessing upon the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been with someone and you felt like you did not really know, know them? It is possible to be with someone and not really know them. Um, many a teenager, my own also, has made the statement to their parents, you don't know me. It's almost humorous that a teenager would say to their mom and dad, you don't know me, when they brought them into this world. More than once, a spouse has said, to their spouse, the same thing. You don't know me. Many relationship is a surface or a shallow relationship and lacks depth. We find here that these men have been walking with Jesus. They've been observing him, and yet they did not really know him. So the title of my message Today is being with someone but not knowing them. Is that even possible? Sure it is. Let me read the text again. Jesus said, If you'd known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? This was hard for Philip and Thomas and some of the other disciples to wrap their head around the idea that Jesus and God were the same, that they were one. Even though they were individual, they were one. And my wife and I are individuals, but we are one, see? And my children, we are individuals, but we are one family. And Jesus was trying to teach this to his disciples. In fact, if you read earlier in the, in the chapter before, uh, Peter was talking to Jesus in verse 36 through 38. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me here afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And here again, Peter doesn't really even know himself. He's been around himself his entire life, but he really doesn't know what his convictions are at that point. And he tells Jesus, I'll lay my life down for you. But we know that in just a short frame of time, he is denying Christ, not willing to lay his life down. So at that point, he didn't even know himself. Thomas, in chapter 14, verse 5 and 6, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is trying to explain to Thomas the way, and Thomas says, how can we know the way? And yet Jesus had told Thomas that he was the way. So here Thomas is with Jesus, but he doesn't really know Jesus. Philip, again in verses 7 through 9, he says, Lord, show us the Father. And then again, Jesus says, 
The Father and I are one. And uh, in chapter 14, verse 22, uh, we have Judas. And uh, Judas saith unto him, not Judas of Scarlet, but another Judas. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. Here, he's talking to Judas, and Judas is trying to understand, but yet he's with Jesus, but he doesn't really know Jesus yet. And of course, there are others. In chapter 16 and verse 17, the Bible says, Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me again. A little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. Then said, therefore, they said, therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while, we cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, do you inquire among yourselves of that I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? See, Jesus is teaching them all of this, trying to help them understand him, and yet they are full of questions. They still do not understand and know Jesus. In chapter 16, I want to read verses 29 through 31. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Can you see Jesus Christ with everything in his human power, trying to convince his disciples that he is God, trying to convince them of his uh, death, burial, resurrection, trying to convince them of him coming back to receive them. And, and they're just so full of questions and they, 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 they don't understand. And finally it clicks with them. Finally they understand. But you know, it is possible to be with someone and not yet know them. And what's interesting here is that these disciples are with Jesus, but they don't know him. Now there are several truths that are tucked in this text worth observing. And I want to share those with you this evening. Number one, seeking, seeking, you know, and, and they are seeking, but when I go to the store, I go seeking. I don't just go to the store just to browse around and shop. I go looking for something. Have you ever gone to a, a, a the grocery store and forgotten your grocery list? And now all you can do is try to remember. And ultimately you wind up forgetting something and, and probably the thing that's most important, probably the thing you actually went to go get, but you don't have a list. You're seeking. When I go to the store, I go looking for something specific. Let me ask you another question. When you come to church, do you go seeking or sightseeing? Are you just going to look around, see what's going on, look at everybody else, see who's nice, nice, nicely dressed and, and see who's in good health and who's not there and who is there? Why do you come to church? You come seeking you come wanting to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ. Many come to Jesus for different reasons. In Luke chapter 6, verse 19, we have a, a group that comes to Jesus, and the Bible says, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Now, these people are coming to Jesus because they're, healing, they're coming for healing. See? So here's a group of people. They're coming specifically seeking Jesus for healing. In Luke chapter 15, in verse 1, the Bible says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now, these particular people, not specifically coming for healing, they, they're not coming because they have a disease. They're not coming because they have a specific need. They're coming just to hear what he's got to say. All they want to do is hear him and hear what he's got to say, and then they're going to decide what they believe. They're coming just to hear. And then in Mark chapter 12, we have another group that comes to Jesus. They're coming for a completely different purpose. In verse 12, the Bible says, And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people. For they knew that he had spoken 
the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Now they're sending another group of people, and these people are coming for hostility. All they're trying to do is they're not coming to hear the truth. They're not coming for healing. They're not coming because they have a specific need. They are coming with a purpose to destroy Jesus. You see, people come seeking for different reasons. Here's my question. Why do you come to Jesus? It's amazing that in a, a crowd that comes to the house of God, everyone's coming for a different reason. Secondly, we come for seeking. Secondly, we come to serve serving. And this is the beginning of every relationship. Now we're, we're talking here about a relationship with Jesus Christ. We come to Jesus seeking. We want to develop a relationship with him. We, we, we want to cultivate a healthy relationship. But after we seek and find Jesus, the next thing we do is we develop this relationship and it becomes one of serving. And this is the beginning of every relationship. Remember the early years wanting to serve you got saved and you you began to feast on the word of God and you got you got a hold of prayer and you found out you could get things from God and then you realized that you wanted to help people. You wanted to serve God, but you couldn't just serve Jesus. You had to serve the people of God. And so you got pretty excited wanting to serve. By the way, that happens when a when a young man marries a, a young woman. What does he want to do? He wants to serve. You remember you held the door? for your young bride. Serving will always stop though when it becomes selfish. If serving continues, it leads us to the next point and that is suffering. See, first we seek, then we serve. And if we can get past that and continue on, the next step comes into play and that's suffering. In, uh, Luke chapter 16 and verse 1. I'm sorry, I think John chapter 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Jesus was warning them about suffering. Now remember, these disciples, they're following Jesus, they're serving. They're feeding the multitudes. They're gathering crowds together. They are with him. They were seeking. They found him. They recognized he was the Messiah. They began to serve with him. But Jesus warned them persecution is going to come. And you're going to have to endure some suffering. He says you're going to get kicked out of the synagogues. You're going to endure some buffering. Uh, you might even get arrested. And so did you know, though, that when suffering begins, many people... They stop serving when the suffering begins. Let me ask you a question. Has someone hurt you? Has someone offended you? I don't know how many Christians I talk to, they quit serving the Lord because someone hurt them. Someone offended them. Someone tried to destroy them. Has someone tried to destroy you? That's when the suffering begins. Suffering requires continual forgiveness. Um, you got to learn to get past this part, the suffering part. I, I, I was privileged to watch and observe Dr. Jack Hiles for years. I, I, he was the object of, of, of the attack of many. And I watched and I observed how he forgave. I also served under the ministry of Dr. Wilford McCormick, McCormick for many years. He was also the object of attack from many people. But I watched how he forgave. See, suffering requires continual forgiveness, and unconditional love. You can't really know someone until you suffer with them. See, I'm thinking of my brother. When the opportunity came for him to serve in a capacity of the administrator of Camp Tracy Children's Home, he accepted it. And uh, he was telling me the story one time how he felt like just quitting, just giving up. And his wife did too. He was out working with a teenager, an obstinate, rebellious teenager, and that's what the children's home uh, was started for, is to help uh, wayward teenagers. And there was one particular teenager, my brother was trying to 
bend over and teach him how to put a plant in the ground. And the teenager grabbed a hoe handle while my brother, the administrator of the children's home, was bent over. And he took that hoe handle and began to beat my brother. And my brother turned around to defend himself, and the hoe handle came down and cracked his uh, collarbone. And he struggled for a little bit, and he even felt like hitting the teenager back. But he restrained himself, and that night he went home. And him and his wife talked about it, and I'm telling you, they were ready to quit. But they didn't quit. He kept on going and kept on going, and many testimonies like that. See, suffering is part of serving. And many people quit when they get offended, when they get hurt, when some Christian leader uh, turns on them or goes out into the world or falls into sin, and they quit because they can't handle the suffering. See? But that's that's part of it. It, it requires forgiveness in any relationship. Suffering. Seeking, serving, suffering. And then lastly, staying. In John chapter 6, in verse 66, I want to read this text to you. I want to read two verses to you. The Bible says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, Jesus had more than 12 disciples. These were just apostles. But he had many, and many of them got offended. It doesn't matter why, but they got offended. And from that time, many of his disciples went back. What did they go back to? They went back to their old way of life. They went back to their old practices. They went back to their old vices. They went back to not following Christ and walked no more with him. Jesus turns, verse 67, then said Jesus unto the 12, will ye also go away? Can you see our Savior looking for some true followers, some true fellowship, some true friends? And he turns to them after enduring this great forsaking and says, will you also go away? And that's where Peter says, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Where are we going to go? And Peter says, we're in this. You see, he stayed. Dr. Howells once said, the difference between me and other preachers during hard times is they quit and I stayed. He said, that's the only difference. He said, I'm not a great preacher. It's just they quit and I stayed. In the in, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is the apostle. After Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, after he had ascended into heaven, after the uh, explosion of the church, and now the persecution begins. See? What are you going to do during a time of persecution? Stay. You know, I was listening to a reporter. This was back during the uh, Trump campaign uh, before the, he got elected president. And... Um, Here's what the reporter said. He said that Donald Trump stayed with one theme the entire program, the entire campaign. And you know what that is. What is Donald Trump's campaign? Four words. Make America great again. MAGA. And he stayed with it. And the same reporter said he followed the Hillary campaign. And he said that the DNC tried 85 different slogans in their words, to see what worked best. So they, wouldn't, they couldn't stay with anything. They were all over the map. You see, these four things are going to win every time. Seeking, serving, suffering, and staying. That will work in any relationship, and especially your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that and by the way, your marriage with Christ and your marriage with your spouse is one and the same as taught in Ephesians chapter 5. They're the same. The commitment's the same. You can be with someone and not really know them, or you could get to know them. There are 12 disciples, apostles. One quit, 
and 11 stayed. We know these things. And all I'm doing today is I'm giving you words. See, I have no visual. I have no pictorial. I have no object lesson. All I have is words. But what you can do is you can get to know Jesus Christ. You can get to know your spouse. You can get to know the people in your relationships. Or you can be with them and not really know them. Why don't we take a moment and sincerely do some soul searching and ask God to help us in each of our relationships. We have a duty, see? And every relationship that you have, God gave it to you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll bless these thoughts. Lord, I pray that you'll help us realize that we, we can literally be in the same room with people and not know them. Lord, in this age where everyone's got their eyes glued to a cell phone or a, a uh, communications device, Lord, we can be in the same room, even across the same table and not be able to look at each other and hear what they're saying. Dear Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'll convict our hearts on this matter. Help us to know the Lord Jesus. Jesus looked at Philip and said, have, have thou, Hast thou not known me, Philip? And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to get to know the people in our lives. Please convict our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.